Hello everybody, my name is Iman and SAD. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're gonna go ahead and cover chapter five. Now chapter five is all about stereoisomerism. Now in stereochemistry, stereoisomerism is a form of isomerism in which molecules have the same molecular composition and the same sequence of bonded atoms but they differ in the 3D orientation of their atoms in space. They differ from constitutional and conformational isomers in many ways, and we will see exactly how in this chapter. Now, in our discussion today, we're going to start by talking about what chirality is and how to identify a chiral center. And then we're going to learn how to assign that chiral center a specific configuration, either an R configuration or an S configuration, and we're going to learn all the rules that are associated with that. Then we'll use the number of chiral centers and their RNS assignment to define, distinguish, and identify enantiomers, diastereomers, and meso compounds. Now, previously, we've talked about what we call molecules that have the same molecular formula but do not have the same connectivity. We know these to be constitutional isomers. And I'm going to make the page just a little smaller just so we can see this whole flow chart. Now, molecules with the same molecular formula, but they are not, the atoms are not connected in the same way, diff, not the same connectivity we know as constitutional isomers. And here's a good example C3H7Cl. Uh, all right, they both have this molecular formula, but look how all the atoms are connected in a different way in both of these molecules. Now, if you do not, if you do have the same connectivity, all right, then we're going down this branch right here. If you have the same molecular formula and the same connectivity, now we're talking about stereoisomers. And the follow-up question is, well, can you convert one molecule into the other simply by rotation? If your answer is yes, then we're talking just about conformational isomers, which we talked about in detail in Chapter 4. Remember, some molecules you can... We, we conveyed some molecules through Newman projections, and then we were able to easily rotate about a carbon-carbon single bond. These two Newman projections convey the same molecule. We've simply rotated the back carbon. All right. Now, if you cannot convert in between molecules simply by rotation, right, then we get into configurational isomers. And this branch, this branch is the top layer. Within this branch lays the topics that we're going to cover here today in Chapter 5. So let's get into it. We'll start with chirality. What is chirality? Objects that are not superimposable on their mirror images are called chiral objects. The opposite of this is achiral. Now a good example of chirality is your hands. If you place both of them face down on the table and then you try to take your right hand and place it over your left hand, they are not superimposable. Now, in terms of identification, a chiral center is a carbon with four different groups attached to it. I'm going to repeat that. That's very important. Remember, in terms of identification, a chiral center is a carbon with four different groups attached to it. Your first step should always be to identify the number of chiral centers in a molecule. If you have zero chiral centers, then you're not going to have any types of stereoisomers possible. There are a few exceptions here. We're not going to cover them in this session. Now, if you have one chiral center, then your molecule can have a enantiomer. That's the possible stereoisomers are enantiomers. If you have two or more chiral centers, the types of stereoisomers that are possible are enantiomers and diastereomers. And of course, we're going to be defining these terms since they're very important in more detail in just a little bit. But let's learn how to spot chiral centers. We have two molecules here. We have azorbic acid, which is just vitamin C, and mestranol. All right, so we're going to take a look at both of these molecules and we're going to try to identify carbon atoms with four different groups attached to them. All right, let's take a look at vitamin C first. 
All right, this carbon right here cannot be a chiral center. Why? Because it has two hydrogens attached to it. All right, so there's no way I'll have four different groups if two of them are hydrogens. Now, this is the same case for this carbon and this carbon because they are this this carbon has a double bond so it's bonded twice to another carbon all right so two of its bonds are to the same group and likewise for this carbon so neither of these are going to be chiral centers well what about this carbon right here does this carbon have four different groups attached to it well let's take a look it has a hydrogen that's hiding back here it has an alcohol group then it has uh, a methanol on this side and then it has this ring structure on the other side so those are four different groups that's perfect that means that this carbon is a chiral center it's our first one that we've identified awesome well what about this carbon right here? Does it have four groups attached to it? Well, there's a hydrogen right here. All right, then this whole group right here with double alcohols. On this side, it's directly attached to an oxygen. And to this side is the rest, the other half of that ring structure. So again, this carbon also has four different groups attached to it. That means this carbon is another chiral center. So vitamin C has two chiral centers. Now, what about mestranol? All right, well, off the bat, we know any carbons in this ring, in this, uh, in this ring, all are double bonded. So that means two bonds are to the same thing, and none of these carbons are gonna be chiral centers. The same goes for any of these carbons where they are where they obviously have two hydrogens there none of those can be chiral centers either now this carbon right here has three hydrogens right because it's a meth a, a methyl group and this is a triple bond all right so same case goes with triple bonds as double bonds those carbons have three bonds to the same carbon. We want a carbon with four different groups. So none of the red or blue dots can be chiral centers. Well, how about we explore some of these carbons that we missed out here? This one, this one, this one, and this one, and this one, all these five carbons. All five of these carbons actually have four different groups attached to them. This carbon here is attached to this car, uh, ring structure and this ring structure and this ring structure in all in different ways and it has a hydrogen that is implied there and the same case for all of these green carbons so this molecule actually has five chiral centers awesome so now that you can identify chiral centers let's learn how to assign the configuration of a chiral center. Every chiral center, at every chiral center, you're going to either assign R or S. But, like, what does that actually mean? This is an attempt to relay information on the spatial arrangement of atoms at a chiral carbon center. Now, the Kahn Inglot prelog rules will help us do just that in five steps. And we're going to go ahead and go over these five steps as we do this example right here now this example has one chiral center there's only one carbon here that has four different groups attached to it and it is this carbon right here this carbon has a hydrogen attached to it a bromine this ethyl group and this isobutyl group right there all right so four different groups attached to this carbon so one chiral center we're going to go ahead and go through all of these five steps now and try to assign this chiral center either an r or s configuration all right so we start off with our first step identify the four atoms directly attached to the chiral center directly okay not the whole not the whole groups that are attached to it just the atoms that are directly attached to this chiral carbon so directly we have this bromine directly we have this hydrogen atom right here then on this side directly we have a carbon and on the other side another carbon 
Perfect. Now we can move on to step two. Step two says to assign a priority to each atom based on its atomic number. The highest atomic number receives priority one, and the lowest atomic number will receive a priority four. Perfect. So we know that bromine is higher, it has a higher atomic number than hydrogen or carbon. So our bromine is going to get number one. Hydrogen will always have the lowest atomic number because it's atomic number one. It'll get a four group. All right. But now we have these two carbons. Which one gets two and which one gets three? All right. And that's when step three becomes very helpful. If two atoms have the same atomic number, we're going to move away from the chiral center looking at the first point of difference. Okay. So we're going to call this carbon A. And we're going to call this carbon B. Let's go ahead and look at carbon A. What is carbon A directly attached to? It's attached to that carbon. All right. And that carbon is attached to. It has a carbon. Carbon. And a hydrogen. All right. Now let's look at carbon B. All right, what is this attached to? It's attached to a carbon, and that carbon has three hydrogens. Fantastic. All right, so the next atom, what is it attached to? All right, they're both carbons, and they, they have different things attached to them. So now they're going to compete for the first point of difference. All right, and whenever we, the first point of difference we, we get to, we're going to see which one has a higher atomic number. Now, I want you to make a note here. Whenever you're constructing these lists, all right, right, we were looking at carbon A. Okay, what is carbon A attached to directly? All right, we made our list of the, the atoms it's attached to directly. We make this list in order of increasing atomic number, right? And then it's the same for carbon B. What is it attached to? This list needs to be constructed in uh, at highest atomic number to lowest because now we're going to start comparing one by one starting from the top until we meet our first point of difference. And this point of difference is going to help us identify which one of these carbons gets priority two and which one of these carbons gets priority three. So at our first point, they're both carbons. That doesn't help. All right. What about our second point? We have a carbon versus hydrogen. Here is our first point of difference. Carbon versus hydrogen. Carbon obviously has the higher atomic number. That means that for carbon A, carbon A will get priority two and carbon B will get priority three. Fantastic. And we used rule number three to help us figure out between the two carbons which one gets two and which one gets three. So now we need to move on to step four. Step four says rotate the mole molecule so that the fourth group priority is on a dash. All right, so let's look at over here. Our fourth group is not on a dash. It's on a wedge. Group number one is on the, the, uh, on the dash. We need the fourth group to be on the dash. So what that means is we want these to switch positions. All right. But if we're going to make these two switch positions, all right, these also need to switch positions, right? Because in order for the fourth group to actually be on the dash, what we're doing is rotating the molecule. All right. So that means everything is being rotated to get the fourth group on the dash. And so now let's draw what it looks like on the dash is our fourth group. And on our wedge is the first group now. And carbon three is on the left and carbon two is on the right. Now for our first fifth step, we want to determine the, the sequence of one, two, three. All right. If you're drawing an arrow from one to two to three, is does this sequence follow a clockwise order or a counterclockwise order? Because if it's clockwise, then we give that chiral center an R configuration. And if it's counterclockwise, then we give it an S configuration. So let's go ahead and do that. One to two to three. This is clockwise. So this chiral center has an R configuration. Now, 
We figured that out. Fantastic. For a second, I want to pause and I want to discuss step four a little more. Now, you want to rotate the molecule so that the fourth priority is on the dash. All right. Now, sometimes that can be hard because people have trouble rotating molecules appropriately to get the fourth group on the on the dash. All right. And so I just have three trends that you can keep in mind to help you without any rotation determine whether a chiral center uh, is an R or S configuration. All right. Three scenarios. All right. Your first scenario your first scenario is if your fourth group is already on a dash all right if your fourth group is already on a dash all you have to do is ignore the fourth group because it's already on a dash and draw your arrow from one to two to three all right that is counterclockwise so this gets an s configuration and that's it you're done now what if your fourth group is right next to a dash not on the dash, but right next to it. Look at these two examples. Here's my fourth group. Here's the dash. They're right next to each other. Look at the second example. Here's my fourth group. All right. And here's the dash. They're right next to each other. What are you going to do then? You're going to go ahead and draw your arrow from one to two to three. All right. One to two to three. Figure out what that is. That is clockwise, which means R. Okay. Now you assign it the opposite configuration, so S. All right, it's the same thing what we just saw here. In our example, our fourth group right here is right next to the dash. It's not on it, it's right next to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw our arrow from 1 to 2 to 3. That's counterclockwise, which is S, and then give it the opposite, so R. And that is exactly what we got when we actually went through the full rotation of the molecule. All right. Your fourth, your, your third trend can be if your fourth group is across from your dash, like in this example, here's your dash. Here's your fourth group. What do you do in that case? You ignore the fourth group. You draw your arrow from one to two to three. All right. That's counterclockwise. That's S and that's it. That's your answer without any change. So those are the three possible trends you can see in terms of position wise of the dashes near the fourth group. And you can just follow these without worrying about rotating the molecule properly and just assign your R and S configuration at each chiral center this way. Now, we can take the information we've learned about chiral centers um, and R and S configuration and go ahead and do this one example problem right now. All right, so we want to find the chiral centers here. That's our first task. Where are the chiral centers? All right, and then whether they get an R or S configuration. All right, that's our two tasks. So let's go ahead and look at this molecule. None of these carbons are chiral centers. They're all double bonded. So two of their bonds are to the same group. We're looking for carbons with four different groups. Well, here's a carbon. Does it have four different groups? Well, let's look. It has an alcohol, has a benzene ring. There's a hydrogen hiding back here and then it has this nitrogen containing uh, 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 a group so those are four different groups on that carbon that carbon is a chiral center so that's our first that's our first carbon uh, first chiral center right there number one perfect what about this carbon right here this carbon right here has a methyl group it has this nitrogen group it has a hydrogen hiding back here, and this big alcohol benzene ring kind of structure. Perfect. This also has four different groups. So now we have two chiral centers. Fantastic. Now what about this carbon right here? No, this carbon has three hydrogens attached to it. It's a methyl group. So it's definitely not going to be a chiral center. Now let's look at chiral center one and go through all our steps for chiral center one to figure out whether it is R or S. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to draw the carbon and the four groups directly attached to it. All right, so we have our OH, we have our hydrogen hiding back here, 
All right, here's a carbon, and right here's another carbon. Fantastic. Now, our second step is to assign priority. Obviously, the oxygen, the oxygen has the highest atomic number here, so it gets one, and our hydrogen will obviously get four, but now we have two carbons that are tied. So now we have to move into step three to break the tie between these two carbons. I'm going to call this carbon A. I'm going to call this carbon B. All right, we're going to come here and take a closer look at carbon A and carbon B. Carbon A, all right, what is carbon A directly attached to? All right, this carbon A is attached to a carbon over here and two carbons, over, double bonds over here to another carbon. So we count that as two separate carbons and that's it. All right, now carbon B over here. What is this attached to? It's attached to a nitrogen, right? We want to put nitrogen first because it's bigger. Then it's attached to this carbon right here, and it's attached to a hydrogen. Fantastic. Now we want to have them compete until we find the first point of difference. Well, look at that. First point of difference is off the bat. All right, carbon versus nitrogen. Nitrogen has the higher atomic number. So carbon B gets priority two. And carbon A gets priority three. And now we have all our numbers in place. Fantastic. All right, now our fourth step is to get group four on a dash. And look at that. We're lucky group four is already on a dash. So now all we have to do is draw our arrow from one to two to three. That's clockwise. So that means that carbon has an R configuration. Look how easy that was. Awesome. Let's go ahead and do even more practice. Let's do let's do the second chiral center. All right. This was our second chiral center right here. Right here. Let's go ahead and do it. All right. So let's go ahead and draw that carbon and what it is directly attached to. Right over here, we have a nitrogen. Over here, we have a carbon. All right. Then we have a carbon right here and our hydrogen hiding back here. Perfect. Now, our second step, we want to assign priority. Nitrogen, obviously, will get first. It's the highest atomic number. Our hydrogen, lowest, will get four. But look at that. Again, we have two carbons that are tied. So we want to break the tie. All right, that's our third step. So we're going to call this carbon A. We're going to call this carbon B. Let's look at carbon A. Here's carbon A. It's attached to an oxygen another carbon and a hydrogen so oxygen carbon hydrogen now carbon b is just attached to three hydrogens that's it all right this makes it easy for us first point of difference oxygen beats hydrogen that means carbon a gets priority two and carbon b gets priority three now our fourth step is to make sure the fourth group is on the dash and look at that again we're lucky so we ignore group four and all we have to do is draw our arrow from one to two to three. All right, that is counterclockwise. So this chiral center gets an S configuration. All right, so this gets an R configuration and this gets an S configuration. Fantastic, look what we have accomplished. Well, now that we can, now that we can take this information we've learned about chiral centers and RNS configuration, we can begin to understand and identify stereoisomers. And the three terms, the three terms we're going to cover here and discuss and explore for stereoisomers are enantiomers, diastereomers, and meso compounds. Let's start off first with enantiomers, all right? So enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. They, they cannot appear identical simply by rotation. And the requirement to have an enantiomer is at least one chiral center. So if you have these two molecules right here, all right, they have the same molecular formula. They have the same connectivity. They're obviously stereoisomers, all right? But you want to figure out if they are simply identical, all right? if the only difference between these two is like simply by rotation or if they're actually enantiomers how do you how can you tell how can you tell if these are identical or enantiomers especially if mental rotation is dif difficult for you well the easiest way 
to identify and compare these two molecules is using R and S configuration. All you have to do is identify the chiral center in both of these molecules and compare that chiral center to, to each other in both of these molecules. All right, so both of these molecules have one chiral center right here. Okay, we go ahead and we need to figure out whether these chiral centers are R or S. Okay, now, hypothetically, if both of them are the same, for example, if both of these chiral centers are R, all right, that means these molecules are identical. End of story. All right, if they're both S, they're identical. End of story. But if one of them is R, all right, if this chiral center is R and this chiral center is S, then these molecules are enantiomers. All right, if these chiral centers have opposite configurations, then they are enantiomers. Now we follow the same logic if there were a molecule with two chiral centers and we were trying to see if, if they were enantiomers or not. All right, if we had a molecule with two chiral centers, all right, if they have two chiral centers and we want to figure out whether they are enantiomers or not, then at each chiral center when we're comparing them, for example, if we're comparing these, these two chiral centers here, all right, if there are to be enantiomers, these have to have opposite configurations and these have to have opposite configurations for them to be enantiomers. So this has to have S and then, then this, have to, this will have to have R. And if this one was also S, then this would have to have R. At both chiral centers that we're comparing the two different molecules, they have to have opposite configurations in order to be enantiomers. So you follow the same trend, whether it's one chiral center or two. Now, diastereomers are non-superimposable and not mirror images. In other words, they are non identical stereoisomers. So let's let's look at these two molecules here. They have the same molecular formula. They have the same connectivity. They're stereoisomers. But we want to figure out if these are identical, if these are enantiomers, or if they are potentially stereo uh, diastereomers. In order to do this, again, we rely on R and S configuration. We're going to have to figure out, oh, they have this is, they have two chiral centers. We have to figure out what is the configuration for these two chiral centers. And then what is the configuration for these two chiral centers? All right. Now, if everything is the same, all right, if this is R and this is R and this is S and this is S, all right, if everything is the same, then these molecules are simply identical. All right. But what if, what if they were complete opposites each other? If this was R, for example, if we did the if we did the uh, R and S configuration, we found out it was R, just just hypothetically, and this one was S, cool, and this one was S, and this one was R. Look at that; these two are opposites, and these two are opposites. They're both opposites. Comparing those two chiral centers in one molecule to the other two chiral centers, the similar chiral centers in the other molecule, they have opposite configurations. Then they are enantiomers. All right. Now, what if? All right, let's do this again. What if when we're comparing, all right, what if when we're comparing this chiral center and this chiral center, this was R and this was R. So they're the same. They have this position. They both have the same chiral uh, uh, configuration. And then when we compare this chiral center to this chiral center, they're actually opposites. All right, if you have a mix of same and opposite, then what we have here are diastereomers. All right, so that is the trend that you want to follow when you're trying to identify if two molecules, what they are to each other, if they have the same molecular formula and connectivity. Are they identical? Are they enantiomers? Are they diastereomers? Well, you're going to fall back to your R and S configuration. If everything is the same, then they're identical. If uh, if they're all opposites of each other, all right, if 1A and 2A are opposites and 1B and 2B are opposites, then they're enantiomers. 
If you have a mix of opposite and same, then you have diastereomers. All right. So now we've di defined enantiomers uh, and diastereomers, but we want to make note of something that's really important, and that's meso compounds. Meso compounds are compounds that have chiral centers but are actually a chiral compounds. So sometimes you'll be told to draw all the stereoisomers of a molecule, like we'll do over here. And this is a prime example. We're going to be asked to draw all the possible stereoisomers and identify their relationships. After you draw all the stereoisomers, you got to tell us what are the enantiomer pairs and what are the diastereomer pairs. Sometimes you'll think two molecules might be enantiomers, right? Because you'll identify the two chirals, you'll identify chiral centers, perfect, and then they'll have opposite configurations. They'll have opposite configurations. All right, and then you'll assume that they're enantiomers right off the bat. But because of reflectional symmetry sometimes, all right, they actually turn out to be meso compounds. They're identical and they're only different by simple rotation. All right, so we're going to do an example and we're going to encounter meso compounds. And I'm going to show you how to figure out if uh, a pair that we thought were enantiomers are actually meso compounds. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with this example, keeping in mind this step by step. All right. So you have a molecule with two chiral centers, all right? Your first step is if you have two chiral centers, how many stereoisomers do you have? You have 2N, where N is the number of chiral centers. So if you have two chiral centers, that's 2 to the power of 2, you'll have four stereoisomers. And you're going to have to draw all the possible stereoisomers, so you're going to have fun with wedges and dashes and a mix of both. Then what you're going to do is you're going to look at each stereoisomer. You're going to identify R and S configuration at every chiral center for the molecule. All right, then you're going to find your enantiomer pairs. Your enantiomer pairs will have opposite R and S configuration. Now, step four is only optional, is optional and you'll only do it if, you if the molecule has reflectional symmetry. If your molecule has reflectional symmetry, that means you can draw a line somewhere in your molecule and one side looks exactly like the other. If you have reflectional symmetry, then you have to check for mesos. And I'm going to show you how to do that right here in, in this next example problem. All right, after you've potentially figured out a meso compound within, your, within what you thought was a stereoisomer, then you can go ahead and identify your diastereomer pairs. And remember, they have a mix of same and opposite RNS configuration. So let's go ahead and do this example problem here. This example problem tells us to draw all the possible stereoisomers of this molecule. This and identify their relationship. This molecule has two chiral centers, which means it has two to the power two stereoisomers. So that means four. So we're going to draw all the stereoisomers. We're going to draw one with both of them wedges. We're going to draw them with both dashes. And then we're going to do a mix of dash wedge and wedge dash. All right, so those are all our stereoisomers. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to begin to assign for each one at their chiral centers RNS configuration. So for molecule one at site A, what is the configuration. I'm going to go ahead and give you these since we've done so much practice on assigning chiral centers. 1A is R and 1B is S. Now, if we look at molecule 2, again, same identification A and B. At position A, it'll have an S configuration and B will have an R configuration. If we look at molecule 3, at A, it's S and at B, it's S. And if we look at molecule 4, at A, it's R and at B is R. So now we need to figure out the R enantiomer pairs, keeping in mind that we're looking for opposite chiral center configuration. So if we have SS, then its enantiomer pair is RR. Look at that. Molecule 3 at position A and B, it's SS. And in molecule 4, it's exactly the opposite, RR. They're opposite. So that means molecules 3 and 4 are enantiomers. So they're an enantiomer pair. Now, look at molecule 1 and 2. We have 
RS and we have SR. Look at that. At position A, they're opposites. And at position B, they're also opposites. Guess what? That makes molecule 1, 2 also an enantiomer pair. Beautiful. But guess what? We don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. So we want to double check that. We want to fact check our enantiomer pairs. Why? Because our molecule has reflectional symmetry. If we draw a line right through the middle, this side looks exactly like this side. So now we want to check for mesos. We already know it has reflectional symmetry and two chiral centers. The third thing that we want to find to make sure that to, to check if we have a meso compound or not is do you have two molecules um, that have opposite RSSR? Wait, hold on. Yes, we do. Molecules one and two, not only do they have two chiral centers, and reflectional symmetry, but they have this op they have both chiral configurations in one molecule. This molecule one has RS and molecule two has SR. Alright, so in fact, those two molecules are not an enantiomer pair like we thought. They are achiral, they're meso compounds. Alright, so we had to so it's a good fact it's a good good call on us for fact checking ourselves all right these are actually meso compounds so we have one enantiomer pair and one and two are actually just meso compounds all right now we can move on to our last step five figure out our diastereomer pairs all right diastereomer pa diastereomers have one chiral center that is the same configuration and the other that's opposite so Let's erase all this that we've drawn, and let's try to figure out what our diastereomer pairs are. All right, so we're looking for molecules that have one same chiral center and one different. Well, look here. This molecule has SR, molecule 2. Molecule 3 has S. These are the same. And then S, and these are opposite. One same, one opposite. They have a mix of same and opposite configurations at their chiral centers. This is a diastereomer pair. So we're going to go ahead and write that. Two and three are diastereomers. Beautiful. Now, let's look at molecule one and four. Molecule one has RS, and molecule four has RR. At position A, they both have R. In position B, they have SR. They're opposites. One is the same and one is opposite. So they have a mix of same and opposites. Molecule 1 and 4 are also diastereomers. Fantastic. So that's how you complete that example problem. Now let's do a few more problems just to encompass everything we've learned about in terms of identifying chiral centers, assigning RNS configuration, and identifying between enantiomer diastereomers, drawing all the stereoisomers, and whatnot. Let's do a couple problems. Are these pair, is this pair enantiomer or diastereomer? So what we're going to have to do is find all the chiral centers, all right? Find the chiral centers and then assign RNS configuration. Now, this molecule has actually three chiral centers, all right? Three chiral centers. All right, we're going to go ahead and assign each chiral center either R or S configuration, okay? Now, for this one, we have a hydrogen back here. This will be our fourth group priority. The oxygen will be our first. This carbon will actually be two, and this carbon will be three. And if we draw our arrow from one to two to three, that's clockwise, so this is an R configuration. All right, this will be an R configuration. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you all right, this is an R configuration. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this is an S configuration and this is an R configuration. All right, and we're going to go ahead and label this A, B, and C. And we're comparing it to the same A, B, and C over here. All right, we're going to go ahead and figure out the R and S configuration of this. Now, this is an S configuration. This will be uh, S, ooh, and this will be R. Okay, so we've identified our chiral, chiral centers. I, I kind of gave you the RNS configuration just for the sake of time. You can go ahead and check for yourself as well, knowing the answer. All right, now let's compare A 
to each other. Let's compare B to each other and let's compare C to each other. At, at position A, all right, these two molecules, one molecule has an R configuration, all right, and one has S at position A. Now, when we compare chiral center B to each other, all right, this one has S and this one has S. All right, let's write that down. S, S. Oh, my pen does not want to work. Okay, and now if we compare chiral center C to each other, right over here, let's do orange. All right, we have R, R. Okay, let's write. go ahead and write that down. R, R. Now, this first position is opposite. And then these two are the same. So we have a mix of opposite and same. That means these two molecules are actually diastereomers. All right, so that's how you figure out. Now, if they were all opposites, they would be enantiomers, but they're not. There is one position in both that is, that is opposite, and the rest are the same configuration. This makes these two molecules diastereomers. All right, let's go ahead and do, let's go ahead and now do this problem where we are asked to draw all the possible stereoisomers of this molecule. All right, so what we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to draw it again right here. All right, this molecule has two, has two chiral centers. Guess what? That means it has two to the power of two stereoisomers, four. We're going to go ahead and we're going to draw them. All right, both wedges, both dashes. All right, and then we're going to do a mix of wedge and dash and see, and then go ahead and compare. Oh, my pen does not want to work. Fantastic. Okay, let me try this. Oh, there we go. All right, then a wedge, dash, and dash, wedge. Fantastic. All right, so here are our four stereo isomers. Fantastic. Now we want to go ahead and we want to assign, all right, at each chiral center in all of these molecules, R and S configuration. I am going to go ahead and give them to you for the sake of time. All right. This is R and this is S and this is S and this is R and this is R and this is R and this is S and this is S. All right. So we have our four stereo isomers and we have each chiral center, uh, assigned its conf R or S configuration. Fantastic. So now what we want to do is we want to find our enantiomer pairs. Remember, our enantiomer pairs are going to have opposite configuration. So if this position is R and this position is S, we're looking for a molecule that has that opposite, S and R. Look at that. These two are an enantiomer pair. All right, and if we have R, R, then we're looking for its enantiomer pair to have S, S. All right, look at that. That's another enantiomer pair. Fantastic. Wait, wait, hold up. This molecule, doesn't it have reflectional symmetry? Yes, it does. If we draw a line right down the middle, one side looks exactly like the other. So before we get carried away by saying we have two enantiomer pairs, let's see if one of these is a meso compound. Remember, if you have a if you have a molecule with two chiral centers and reflectional symmetry, all right, then the enantiomer pair that has RS and SR is actually going to be your meso compound. So this is not an enantiomer. This is our meso compound. It's actually a chiral. All right. So what we actually have is one enantiomer pair. These are just meso. Fantastic, we're making great progress. Now, our last step is to identify our diastereomer pairs. Remember, diastereomers will have one position that is the same and then one position that's opposite. One and three, look at that, are diastereomers. Diastereomers. And that, and if we look at two and four, all right, these both have S right here and then they have opposite configuration. 
So same and opposite. The, this is another diastereomer pair. So for this molecule, we have drawn all the possible stereoisomers, and we've also assigned the enantiomer pair, we've identified our meso compound, and we've identified our diastereomer pairs. We have accomplished everything. All right, so now just to put into perspective one more time, here's our flow chart again. All right, same molecular formula, different connectivity. We have constitutional isomers, same molecular formula, same connectivity. We begin to talk about stereoisomers. Now, if you can get one molecule from the other simply by rotation, then what you have are conformational isomers. But if you can't, then what you're talking about are configurational isomers. If they're restricted by rotation, all right, we're talking about geometric configurational isomers. This will be your cis and trans. Cis and trans are diastereomers. All right, and if they are not restricted by rotation, so there are no double or triple bonds, then you're talking about optical configurational isomers. And remember, we've, we've learned about what enantiomers and diastereomers, how to identify them using R and S configuration. So I hope this session was helpful. If you have any questions at all, leave them in the comments below. If you want to see more practice problems for this chapter or specific practice problems, go ahead and let me know and I'll be more than happy to try and accommodate that. Other than that, happy studying and have a fantastic day.